A very good uh, uh, evening to all of you and a good morning or a good afternoon from wherever you're joining. Welcome to our Saturday Vibe Talks with the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies. Um, uh, we are an institute for anthropology, archaeology, culture and heritage. I've given a brief. We were just chit-chatting, so I'm not going to repeat that again. But uh, we are very happy to welcome Hugh Grainer um, at the Himalayan Institute Saturday Vibe Talks. We are celebrating the state of Jammu and Kashmir all of January. And today we have um, a wonderful talk on um, the early photographers uh, in Kashmir from 1861 to 1920. Uh, Hugh will give us a perspective into uh, the perspectives of early photographers and the use of photography to document the landscape, architecture, and culture of Kashmir. The presentation is a brief introduction to the work of some of the pioneer photographers working in Kashmir, beginning with Captain Robert Melville Clark, who made the first known photographs in 1861, and then later photographers, both amateur and professional, who worked there over the following 60 years, including photographers like Samuel Bourne, James Craddock, Baker and Burke, John Shash, Frith and Company, Henry Sr. and Vishnu Nath. And just a little while ago, Eric said that he is, he's been the curator for Samuel Bourne's uh, uh, work as well. So that's very uh, exciting. Uh, there were many anonymous photographers, often just visiting tourists and travelers, who also produced important visual documentation of both the region's landscape, architecture, and people. The talk is illustrated with photographs taken primarily from the Hugh Grainer collection of early Indian photography. And photographs, you know, nowadays when we take photographs, it's almost like um, separating the ugly and the beautiful. I'm sure photography in the past was all beautiful because there was no ugliness around. Uh, nowadays, uh, you know, the filth that we see in the Himalayas makes us compose photographs in, in terms of separating what we don't want to see. And composition back then was all about beauty, I guess, and maybe not, I don't know what it was. Maybe Hugh can shed light on it uh, and um, really bring us closer to the mystical and uh, beautiful landscape that the early photographers saw and a landscape that we so want to achieve today. Uh, and maybe it sparks that inspiration in all of us uh, um, to, to capture that beauty and let it once again seep into our own lives today. So Hugh, over to you, uh, your talk. So looking forward to the early photographs of Kashmir and photo photographers of Kashmir and um, so much more. Over to you. Great, fine. Thank you, Sonali. Right. Um, well, welcome everyone who's turned up. Uh, nice to see lots of people know. So uh, that's great. So if I can get the technology to work and I can share my screen, which is, let's see, see, see if we can get it to work. Oh, Lord, security and privacy. Right. It should work. Come along. Let's just come up with a whole load of things. Should have sorted this out in advance. I had to go. Right, permission to share the screen. Mm -hmm. Right, hang on, there'll be a slight. No, no worries, take your time. Why it's. We are all an eager audience and we are right, very patient. Yes. Let's see. Share, right, how are we doing? Okay, can anyone see that? Anything come through? Yes, we can see. We can see it. Thanks. Okay, fine. Um, let's see if I can get it to go to. Uh, right. Okay, I think that's working. <laughs> I can see it anyway. <laughs> yes. Fine. Okay, well, this, uh, 
I want to go through and just this talk will be in a way fairly superficial because there are so many photographs and photographers in Kashmir and I could be here for mm -hmm. a week talking about them all and showing thousands of photos so I've edited it down to about 100 images and more information but I'll, I'll try not to spin it out beyond two or three hours so um right I'll start initially with the arrival of photography in India it was invented jointly in eight, about 1839 when it was first publicized in England and France um news of the invention of photography turned up in India in the middle of 1839 and the first experiments were being made um most famously by a chap in Calcutta, Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, who was a well-known uh, scientist. Um, and this was, as I said, started 1839 into 40. There was then a hiatus really, when people were used starting to spread photography around India um, through, during the 1840s. Um, but uh, it didn't really make its way up country to Kashmir for quite a while. The processes involved in photography, I'll mention these very fleetingly for those who don't know. The main photography processes were the calotype, the salt paper process invented by Fox Talbot in England using wax paper negatives. Uh, relatively straightforward to use, but not wonderful quality. Uh, it, by the 18... Sorry, we're getting out of kilter here. I mustn't touch anything. Um, by the 1850s, the wet plate collodion process, which gave much higher quality, came in and was the, really the main process from the 1850s onwards, uh, used by pretty much all the photographers in Kashmir. Um, very complicated you had to coat your own glass plates and take an entire darkroom kit with you when you traveled into even up into the hills so it was very few people mainly very keen amateurs and professionals who actually used photography out out of the studio um these glass plates had to be coated exposed and processed on site next to your camera and then take them back to a dark room where you could print them onto paper. So enormously complicated, expensive process, which is one of the many reasons why it didn't make its way into the Himalaya till relatively late. Uh, as far as I can work out, it was about 1861 before anyone actually took a camera into Kashmir. There seemed to be a, a variety of reasons for that. I suspect the primary one was the uh, disturbances in the Punjab um, and the uh, the Sikh wars of the 1840s. And there were relatively few travelers going into Kashmir in the 1840s and 50s, just a handful of uh, explorers and diplomats. But nobody, as far as I can tell, seems to have taken a camera with them. Um, the first record I can find of anyone using a camera in Kashmir is an army officer, Captain Robert Melville Clark, who took part in an expedition from Simla up through Kulu to Kashmir, to, L to Ladakh and Lahore, and then back through Kashmir. So at the end, tail end of his journey, he came through down through Kashmir and took photographs in the Vale of Kashmir and around Srinagar, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, the next major traveler we can find is Samuel Bourne, the uh, well-known professional who did a major expedition in 1864 and produced the first large body of serious high quality images of Kashmir. So I'll come on to him in a minute. Uh, about the same time, another professional, James Craddock and Murray based photographers, Baker and Burke also were working in Kashmir during the 1860s. Off, they did left very few records of exactly what where they went and when they did it. So 
it's rather vague working out an exact year for a lot of the work they produced. Um, so Kashmir, most of people went up into Kashmir, starting down in, in places like Murray and Simla and traveling up through the Kangra Valley. Um, this is a brief overview of Kashmir and we'll come to some of the towns in detail. Most of the photography done would tended to be in and around the capital Srinagar and the towns along the route going up the Jhelum towards it. So we have photographs from Vernag, Islamabad, Beach Bihara, Avantipur, Pampur, um, into Srinagar where most people based themselves and two or three other photographers then traveled up the Sindh Valley right up to the Zoji La Pass and the borders with Ladakh. Srinagar, the vast majority of the photographs of Kashmir from the early years, from 1860s and 70s onwards, were taken in and around Srinagar. Uh, it's a very picturesque city with a lot of amazing landscape, wonderful Mughal gardens, um, canal networks and lakes and boats. So it's immensely picturesque um, area and lends itself, as you'll see, very much to uh, some stunning for photographs. Um, I'll start with Captain Robert Melville Clark. As I said, he was an army officer on leave. He was on a shooting expedition from Simla, went up to Ladakh and then came back via Kashmir. He wasn't a wonderful photographer at all, very much an amateur, but he produced a body of landscape photos, which were the first ones we know of taken in Ladakh and in Kashmir, some of which he had published in his uh, in a very small book, um, incredibly rare nowadays, with a complete set of his views in it. I'll start actually in Leh, which is, uh, I think, probably the best image he took in the whole trip of Kashmir or, or Ladakh. Um, it's a lovely view of the main bazaar in, in Leh, um, which appears to have one of his expedition fellow members posed in the foreground, but no sign of uh, much native life apart from a few people in the distance. He then travelled overland past uh, Mulbeck to uh, document the past rock carving there and then over the Zojila and down into Kashmir itself. This is the, seems to be the first image you look at. See, I would say this is the earliest photograph of Kashmir that we know of, 1861, which is a nice view from the top of the hill, the Tukti Suleiman and a view over the town of Srinagar, as it used to be, uh, but is no longer. <laughs> this is, again, the uh, the main mosque in the centre of, uh, of Srinagar. I'll have to skim through some of these images quite quickly because I've got a lot of pictures. Uh, if there's anything you want to see at the end, we can come back and have a second look, but uh, we'll try and uh, get through them. Again, another view of, of the main mosque and the fort. This is the barge of the British resident at Srinagar, uh, who appears to be under the canopy with his family, as far as I can tell. Um, there were a lot of pictures of boats from Srinagar. There were a lot of these fairly spectacular boats owned by the Maharaja and the British resident and anyone else with any money. Uh, and they feature very largely in the pictorial views of Kashmir. Um, this is one of the main bridges, the Amira Bridge. There are about five bridges across the river in the middle of uh, Srinagar. Fairly spectacular and covered with uh, shops. He also then carried on to Martand and photographed the remnants of the temple there. Uh, 
and then headed out of Kashmir, which is down to Bimbor, and then on to Rajouri, the border. I said so they're not spectacularly picturesque or wonderful photographs, but they're important because they're the first ones. Um, the next photographer, who I'm much more au fait with, is Samuel Bourne, who uh, was one of my favourite photographers. He went out to India in 1863 and founded a photographic studio initially in Simla, then later in a branch in Calcutta and eventually one in Bombay. Um, he was a very, very fine landscape photographer. And uh, over the space of seven years in India, he produced about 2000 very fine images of India. He did, after a brief trip to the upper Sutlej in 1863, in 1864, he did this major expedition to Kashmir, which took him about six months traveling from Simla across through the, the Kangra Valley to Dharamsala, Kangra and Chamba, where he took some wonderful photographs and then eventually ended up in Srinagar, where he based himself for much of 1864 and produced and I said 388 that we know of very fine views of the landscape and the people of Kashmir, primarily in and around Srinagar. But he also did an expedition to the top of the Sindh Valley up to the Zojila Pass, uh, but didn't go into Ladakh. This is quite an interesting picture of him. He stopped in Chamba, visited the Raja of Chamba, and uh, set up a portrait group with him and the Raja and the local British uh, officials who lived in Chamba. As he's born on the left, um, he was only about 32 or so at the time, but he uh, looks to be somewhat older with a beard that's very impressive. Um, he then carried on up towards Srinagar and took some interesting photographs en route. This is one again one of my favorites uh, crossing a river on mussocks. Uh, mussocks are inflated ox skins and were the main means of crossing rivers in the Himalaya until people got around to building some proper bridges. Um, rather dodgy places, things to cross a river on. You had to lie across one and be paddled across by a couple of bearers, uh, so a couple of oarsmen. Um, if you were rich, you got to put together with a bedstead strapped across and you could sit up in more comfort, but not on, on these little mountain streams. If you were lucky, there was a bridge to cross. This is a, a Jula bridge near Kishwar. Um, these are very hairy bridges to cross. I've done one or two in my time and uh, you really feel you're taking your life in your hands. Um, walking on a thick rope and held up with two other ropes. Um, but in some areas, it was the only way to get across. You can see here, there must have been a much more substantial bridge before, um, which has collapsed and they've had to put up a rope bridge as a temporary measure. Once he got into Srinagar, he spent a lot of time traveling around the town producing uh, some very fine studies of the landscape and architecture of the city. This is the main poplar avenue. There was a very long, broad line of poplars that run, run across the city. And several photographers have pictured this, but I think this is one of the nicest ones, just perfectly proportioned. Most of the... What? Most of the views he took around Srinagar itself are very of a similar style. This is a classic example where he's put in the river, the trees, a few people and a boat. I mean, it's a beautifully composed study. Um, and a lot of his work was very similar in vain. Um, very evocative of, uh, of the town favorite motif was this ancient bridge built by the Emperor Akbar 
which lends itself to very pictorial photography. Um, so Bourne did one. I'm also, I'm going to diverse slightly and show you the same bridge done by another studio, Baker and Burke, who visited about the same time, but I think three or four years later. Uh, but this was, uh, this bridge was a sort of motif that nobody could resist. So Baker and Burke did a version of it. And John Sachet, about the same time, came back and did his copy of it. So uh, it's, uh, you'll find repeatedly a lot of the photographers who went searching for particularly picturesque views tended to photograph versions of the same view in and around town, which Srinagar has this amazing combination of, of rivers, canals, trees, and architecture, which lends itself to, uh, to producing some very finely composed images. There'll be a lot of, lot of boats in this. Everyone wanted to photograph these big, impressive boats. This is the British Commissioner's boat. Um, again, very similar to the Maharajas. Bourne produced quite, for him, quite a lot of ethnic studies and pictures of local people. He wasn't a great portraitist. Uh, he left that mainly to his partner in Bourne and Shepherd Studios. Um, but he, in Kashmir, he did quite a lot of interesting studies of the local people. Um, having said, a lot of them weren't actually Kashmiri, but a lot of visiting people from Ladakhis and uh, Baltis and other people who came down to Srinagar for work and got uh, got their picture took by Bourne. Um, so there's some nice studies of native people. This is these are the representatives of the Maharaja. Uh, again, they they turn up in several other photographers' work. I suspect. They're actually glorified rent collectors who went round to visit uh, visiting British uh, holiday makers and and collect some form of rent for for camping there. British weren't allowed to ever build houses or anything in Kashmir, so most people had to camp in a tent or hire a houseboat. Um, but these gentlemen turn up in several other photographers' work. Bourne obviously had a good time and went to uh, enjoyed a variety of local entertainments. A lot of Nautch girls there producing uh, music and dance shows. This appears to be a large group of, of Kashmiri uh, dance girls, Nautch girls, um, who again appear in uh, several of his images. Uh, this is an interesting one because we actually have their name. Somebody has... Uh, annotated these prints in, in another album. So they obviously knew the girls, um, but they're nice studies of uh, some of the local ladies. This gentleman is quite famous in his way, Colonel Gardner. He was an American adventurer who I think came from Scotland originally or of Scottish ancestry, but ended up traveling around Afghanistan and was in, ultimately employed by the Maharaja of Kashmir as his colonel of artillery. And he led a very adventurous life. But he even wrote about it. There is a book of his uh, travels and adventures in Afghanistan and Kashmir. But he's a very impressive gentleman who's had himself made up in, uh, had a suit made out of uh, his own tartan. Um, so there's two shots that Bourne took of him, one with some Dogra soldiers from the Maharaja's army. Um, he looks slightly impressive, that less impressive there, and it looks a lot shorter than the, his soldiers, but, uh, but that's a, a sort of classic uh, image. And as I said, quite rare because Bourne did so little portraiture. Here's some other studies he did, um, Dogra soldiers in, in Srinagar. And also, he w went out and photographed some of the villages around and about. And this is the village of Quilon as well. While he was there, he met up with some other groups of uh, British uh, 
officers, sportsmen on holiday who are out on sh doing some shooting and obviously was commissioned to do some photographs of uh, British soldiers who were uh, very much kitted up in local style. Um, another one of some of the officers of the 93rd Highlanders who also commissioned him to do a picture of their camp. Again, this is a nice one because somebody's actually identified the names of all the officers, um, which is quite handy. Most photographs tend to be fairly anonymous and you don't know who people are. So this is wonderful to actually see their names and know which regiment they were of. And again, that's a close up of the same shot. Um, British traveling up in Himalaya tended to uh, adopt a strange mix of Indian and British uh, costume. Um, from uh, Srinagar, Bourne did an expedition up the Sindh Valley, up towards the Zojila Pass, and he took some wonderful mountain views, really spectacular studies of the mountains and glaciers. This is just outside Sonamarg. You'll find this, the spelling of, of a lot of these images varies. Uh, sometimes I've got modern spellings and sometimes I've used the photographer's own spelling. And there seem to be five different ways of spelling the names of all places in, uh, in Himalaya at this time. And this is again coming up towards the Zojila Pass. Um, he did quite a number of studies of the local temples. This is the, the temple at Naushera. And again, another view pretty much to the top of the Zojila. And these were really the first spectacular views of the Himalaya that anyone had produced up to that point. Hardly anybody had taken a camera this high into the mountains before. This is, he didn't, <laughs> he didn't go right up to the Zojilar itself. This is a much later picture by some an anonymous amateur who took a picture right on top of the Zojilar. He took one or two photographs in the gorge below, but didn't, as far as we can work out, go up to the pass itself. So this is a much later image, but just to show the top of the pass. After he'd done his trip, he went, went back to Simla and carried on working, traveling around India, and then left for England in 1870. But his studio he founded, Bourne and Shepherd, carried on right till uh, 2016 when it finally went out of business um, but again they sent another team of photographers back to Kashmir we don't know the exact year but it seems to have been in the early 1880s and we don't know exactly who they were because it was quite a large studio and we don't know which photographers they employed but they produced another large body of Kashmir photographs from the early 1880s and here you can see they'd hired a a large houseboat, which they used as a traveling studio and darkroom. This was taken at, this is the view at Pampur, and, and you can see where the boat sat on the river. And again, they produced a series of views of uh, around Kashmir and Srinagar and some very fine studies. And just fascinating to see how the city looked in those days. It's all been built over now, of course, and much of what you can see here has completely disappeared. And again, another view. And again, some the palace in the center of town, nicely composed. I, I wish I knew the name of the actual employee from the studio who took these, but it's not been recorded, sadly. 
got some lovely views on the River Jhelum. Sorry, jumped a bit. Fish tanks at Bowan. Gulmarg, which became a famous resort for the British traveling and visiting uh, Kashmir. People would go up there to camp and stay for the season. Um, and this is the border of Kashmir, the bridge at Kohala, which uh, we'll see several views of. Um, and the bridge seems to have uh, fallen down and be rebuilt at regular intervals. This is one of its incarnations in the 1880s. This is about, about the same time. This is by another major studio, Baker and Burke, who were based in Murray, but did another expedition around Kashmir, produced a lot of very fine studies of Kashmir and the Sindh Valley and also the Lidar Valley. Um, this is the bridge at Kohala again, which they finally rebuilt more substantially. And this is a picture of the opening ceremony when they finished rebuilding it in 1895. Looks uh, a lot more substantial than its predecessors. Another early photographer who went was James Craddock. He was based in Simla and like Bourne did a trip to Kashmir and Lahore and around and produced again, another fine series of images, very much uh, in the style of Bourne. Um, again, another overview of Srinagar slightly later than born, but really not a lot changed. Vernag, another nice view. The bridge again at Uri, which uh, again went, as I said, went through manifest uh, states, and this is one of its more basic states. It obviously got washed out regularly and rebuilt, as did many Himalayan bridges at that time. Another interesting photographer is Lieutenant Henry Senior, who uh, produced, it's hard to work out whether he was just purely an amateur or did some commercial work, but he did quite a lot of interesting views around Kashmir at some point in the 1860s. With all these photographers, it's often very hard to decide when they were working. Bourne was nice because we know he was there in 1864. He wrote extensively about his trip. Most of these other photographers left no written record of their work, only the images. So you have to guess exactly which year they might have been there. Um, it's very frustrating at times because sometimes a, a five to 10 year window of opportunity to work out when the particular photographs were taken. Um, but uh, he took a lot of interesting photographs. They don't seem to have been sold commercially very widely, unlike Bourne's work. So they're quite hard to find. Uh, I've only got a few original prints in my own collection and uh, most of the image I'm going to show now, I've actually had to poach off the internet. Uh, there are a few online, so these aren't desperately sharp images, but at least they give you a feel for the work he was doing. Uh, again, most of the photographers always went back to the same picturesque views of the primary architecture in and around Srinagar. Um, so you get repeated variations on a theme, views along the canal, bridge on the Markwell Canal, which again is a popular theme that most photographers manage to fit in. 
he traveled up to uh, the Sindh Valley to Amarnath and photographed the cave up there, which is obviously, as you know, a, a great Hindu uh, site, um, which is a high point of a lot of pilgrimage nowadays. Um, this was the cave before it became a major pilgrim and tourist site. Uh, now you can't get near it for all the appurtenances of, of tourism and, and pilgrimage with uh, steps and railings and uh, tarmac trails and, and all the thing. But this is as it used to be before. Now, this is a better print from my collection, which is the view out of the cave mouth looking, uh, looking north which is a fairly spectacular valley. Um, as I said, most of his work wasn't sold commercially, so it's quite hard to get hold of. I just had the odd print. Um, later on, some of his work was turned into lantern slides, glass lantern slides, and they were sold commercially. So you find occasional lantern slides. This is the same image that has been painstakingly hand colored and uh, has come out quite nicely. The next photographer I want to look at is John Sachet, who was another interesting photographer, very much contemporary of Bourne. Um, we still don't know a huge amount about him. He seems to have been German originally, who worked it in America initially, then moved to India and established a studio first in Calcutta and went in partnership with a variety of other photographers over the a few years. Uh, he led a very confusing life trying to work out where he was working and who he was working with. Uh, but he ended up establishing a major studio in Nainital, where he spent the rest of his life, really. Um, and he did some uh, wonderful views of Kashmir. He must have done at least one and probably two expeditions to Kashmir and produced a lot of fine images. These are just some views which I have of his, his traveling studios. You can see the, the tent in the foreground of, uh, oh, hang on, where's it gone? The tent here is uh, his darkroom tent, which is very similar to the one Born used. You had to literally take a, a tent with you next to your camera to process your films in. Um, this is one of his traveling portrait studios with the darkroom tent outside. And a portrait, there's uh, Sachet standing outside his studio. Again, he produced some fine studies, very, very good quality views of the architecture and uh, temple complexes around. Srinagar, very well composed, finely produced. And again, because it was a commercial studio, these were marketed for a long time. So you, they're not widely available. They're becoming increasingly expensive now, but they were produced by, by the hundred and by the thousand. So they can be found, whereas some other photographers work can't be. But he did some, some lovely studies. View of the lake. Again, like the, his predecessors, he traveled up the Sindh Valley. Um, this is near Sonamarg. Up to the head of the valley with the glacier and the river coming out of the glacier. Next major studio who went there were Frith & Co. Francis Frith was a photographer based in England, who himself did a lot of work in Egypt, but then established a company in England, uh, Francis Frith & Co. And he started to commission other photographers to travel literally around the world, taking topographical views for his company, which were then printed and marketed in England. And over the years, he sent several photographers out to India um, and produced and published 
a wide range of fine views of India. Um, as far as you can work out, in 1871, he commissioned an English photographer, Frank Mason Good, to go out to India and travel around the Himalaya and produce again another body of work. And he, um, Frank Mason Good, produced images of Kashmir and then went on to Simla, Kulu, Spiti, Lahore, and produced a large body of, of fine views, which were then taken back to England and marketed from England. Though uh, they were sold by dealers in India eventually, but uh, they produced these large portfolios of, uh, of prints for sale. And he could produce some very fine studies, again, in and around Kashmir. Here we have a, the Maharaja's boat again, always a popular subject. Uh, the Maharaja's representative turning up, they seem to always come to visit. As I said, I suspect they were collecting the rent, but I can't be entirely sure. I'd like to think one of the two European gentlemen is Frank Mason Good himself, but I can't be sure at all. Again, he produced some nice studies of uh, the local people, uh, who most of whom, of course, turned out to not to be Kashmiri. These are Ladakhis. In fact, they're almost certainly from Baltistan, but mistitled as Ladakhis. Um, and again, some, uh, some Nautch girls, always a popular subject. I suspect Nautch girls were the only ladies in Kashmir who were prepared to let themselves be photographed by foreign photographers. So they're always a repeated uh, motif. And again, some nice views. This is at Baramula. Port of Hari Parbat. Oops. Jumping ahead, where have we gone? Right. Um, the one thing is noticeable, there were, don't seem to be of any commercial photographic studios established in Srinagar itself or in Kashmir for the early years. Um, for the rest of India, there were studios in almost every town, um, a lot of them producing portraits of local people and selling uh, these little carte de visite portraits. I can find no records of anyone working, running a studio in Srinagar or in Kashmir generally until quite late in the century. Uh, I have very few carte de visites, size portraits of that were taken in Kashmir. This is one of the few I have, which is quite late. It's about 1890 of, uh, little study of George Rogers, who was the head clerk in the British residence office. And this is him gun in hand with his uh, shikari, obviously taken in the middle of Srinagar. You can see the Poplar Avenue in the middle of Srinagar in the background. But uh, yeah, it's a shame that, that there are not more carte de visite portraits of Kashmiri people of that time. Next. Uh, Quite important photographer, Fred Bremner, who was there a lot later. He was uh, basically working in India, based in Nainital from 1882 and had his own studio through to uh, 1920. And he did a very uh, extensive tour around Kashmir about 1900, 1910 we can't again we can't be precise but very talented and produced some stunning studies of uh, of the landscape around uh, Srinagar and uh, this is I just love this image of uh, boatman on uh, on Lake Dahl and again another view at uh, nearby at Gandawa
I quite like this because you've got the houseboats in the background, which were rented by tourists and were the only way British visitors to uh, Kashmir from an early time could actually stay there. They had to; they weren't allowed to uh, do more than temporarily camp, and they couldn't buy houses, so they ended up staying in houseboats. Another view up at Gulmarg. The first local photographer I can find references to is uh, an Indian called Vishinath, sometimes called Vishunath, but usually Vishinath, who seems to have established a studio in Srinagar sometime in the 1890s. Um, again, I don't have a huge amount of uh, information on him, uh, occasional passing references but uh, we don't know a lot about him but he produced some very nice work took some lovely photographs up in Ladakh as well this is one of the few images I have which is obviously taken on a revolving panoramic camera um from the 19 well from the 1890s onward you get an increasing number of British tourists and foreign visitors coming with their own cameras and they tend to uh, produce some interesting informal views of Kashmir and the people and this is an amateur photographer snapshot I don't even know who it is it's just in a little album of uh, anonymous snapshots from somebody's tour in Kashmir somewhere around the 1900s late 1890s or early 1900s but uh, just a nice uh, study of uh, local wood carriers. A nice one of one of the Srinagar tailor shops. I mean, it's sad that there are so few real portrait studies of the people of Kashmir until quite late in the century. They were, it's only the 1890s, 1900s, almost people started to uh, Pay more attention to the people. Well, that's a nice study. And another amateur snapshot. Randolph Bizant Holmes, also called himself Holmes of the Frontier, another major figure. Uh, in early 20th century photography. Um, interesting chap who established a studio in Lahore uh, and another one in Peshawar and uh, did several trips to Kashmir and again did some very fine work. Um, unfortunately, his studio in Peshawar was destroyed during the partition riots and he lost his entire stock of uh, 40 years worth of uh, negatives and uh, plates and everything and had to give up and come back to England with virtually nothing left of his work. But his, his uh, images were marketed substantially through the 1920s. Uh, you find a lot of his views of Kashmir. He photographed the 1919 uh, Afghan campaign as well was the official photographer. This is a nice view of uh, Nanga Parbat, which are uh, one of my favorite photographs. And again, the Lidar Valley. He was also something of a painter um not an overly talented one it must be said but he uh did some interesting watercolors and, and colorized a lot of his photographs as well this is a rather poor quality copy of a painting he produced a little guidebook uh for his camera work in and around kashmir called camera shikar in kashmir and this is an enlargement of one of the little color plates in it um Not really a photograph, so I shouldn't be showing it to you really, but uh, anyway, it gives you an idea of 
things he was doing. Um, he also took a lot of photographs in and around Srinagar. This is, again, one of my favourites uh, from the Church Missionary Society School in the middle of Kashmir, run by quite a famous uh, missionary, Canon Tyndale Bisco, who, again, was a great self-publicist, uh, ran a boys' school, and he insisted that all the boys had to uh, go for a dip in the river every morning before they started lessons uh, to toughen them up. Um, and this is, I think, a wonderful image of them on the way into the river. And I particularly love the guy saluting on the way down. Right, moving on slightly, this is James Rickleton, who is an American uh, photographer, a, a teacher and uh, professor in America, who was commissioned to travel to India and make stereographs, stereo photographs for an American publishers, Underwoods, and Underwood and Underwood. And he came to India in 1903 to photograph the Delhi Durbar and then also traveled around much of the rest of India, producing stereo cards and also a major trip to Kashmir. And his work was then produced in boxed sets of usually a hundred stereo cards. The Indian one was called India Through the Stereoscope, um, widely published and still fairly readily available. If you want to buy Kashmiri photographs, originals, then his stereo cards are the easiest and the most economical means of starting. You can still find them in England, at least very reasonably priced. Um, but uh, this is one of the, of, uh, the professor with uh, two of the Maharaja's uh, tame giants. He appears in a lot of his photographs. This is another one. He's a, like many photographers, a great self-publicist. So this is him at the Delhi Durbar with the Maharaja's giant and the, the uh, Maharaja of Patiala's midgets. And again, he produced a lot of quite interesting stereos of, of uh, just rural life in and around Kashmir. And these are all, is it about 1903? The view on the river with a houseboat. Back to the uh, Uri Bridge again, which uh, is an even more parlous state this time, and people having to go across on a rope. Back to the uh, boat skin. This is the Lady Curzon, the uh, wife <clears throat> of the Viceroy, Lord Curzon, uh, doing a state visit, and again in the Maharaja's uh, boat. The state barge by this time looks a lot less substantial than the one of uh, 40 years earlier. All these cars, of course, are much better viewed. I should have told everyone to bring a stereo viewer with them so you could actually look at them and get the full 3D effect. And I guess is uh, Professor Rickleton again. I don't think any other photographer photographed himself at work as much as Rickleton did. And then coming to the end, um, this is another stereo, but much later, um, somewhere around 1935, colour photography started to be introduced. And this is uh, quite a scarce colour stereo image from the Shalimar Gardens, which uh, was done by an anonymous amateur photographer. Um, again, technically not brilliant but just historically important because there are so few early pre-World War II colour images of India generally and certainly of, of Kashmir. And I have some others in this series taken up further high up in the mountains of uh, 
in what looked to be in almost in the dark. Um, but uh, but um, a lot of the early photographs were uh, ultimately produced as postcards. If you want, again, if you want to get started in collecting early Kashmir photography, you can find postcards of Kashmir produced from around 1900 onwards. Uh, a lot of them based on photographs taken 20, 30 years earlier. This one seems to be a view by Henry Senior, and then literally 40 years later, produced as a postcard by a firm called Senior & Co in Bristol, England. I'm assuming there are descendants or someone in the family who've taken uh, Uncle Henry's photographs and made postcards of them. Um, but again, there are, there are, I mean, I could do another whole talk just about postcards of Kashmir, but uh, I won't. Um, and again, one of the early major studios, Mahatas, who were established in Srinagar in, uh, in the 1920s and were ran for quite a number of decades, um, mainly doing a lot of uh, developing and printing work for passing visitors but did a certain amount of uh, commercial work under their own steam. But uh, one of the relatively few similar based, um, Srinagar based studios. And I think I'm sort of more or less done now. That's uh, the end. I hope it wasn't too dull. And uh, thank you very much for uh, bearing with me. And I, I hope I've, managed to uh, bring something new for you. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Hugh. Uh, that was such an amazing uh, presentation of the past. And um, uh, I will leave the, um, the stage open for uh, questions. But before I do, it's just, um, Amazing that you see the personalities of the photographers and, uh, you know, truly their perspectives into how they, they saw that world. And also so inspiring that so many of them were employed, um, uh, uh, you know, in um, their posts as, you know, head clerks or British residents. And yet they carried out their works of passion. Um, and, um, and those who were in full-time photography came all the way from England uh, capturing uh, lives uh, of people, of landscapes. And uh, it's just this whole idea of looking at uh, the world from a very black, you know, whenever we think of the past, we think of black and white. Uh, and uh, suddenly you uh, post this uh, colored picture somewhere uh, after 1939, was it, right? Um, the color of image, well, it's about, 1935 as far as i can work out yeah 1935 yeah yeah 19, uh some between 1935 and 1939 yeah. uh, it's hard to be precise the, and, the process carried on till later but it, it's likely it, it predates the world war ii mm -hmm. and it reminds me of my own uh was it um i was four years old back then 1979 and uh you know some of the the, uh, the 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 wooden houses that you see all cl clustered together. I remember that very well. I remember staying in a, a houseboat, um, and so many memories just flashed through. Like as a four year old, what can you remember? But I really remembered a lot, and uh, I remember it not in black and white, but in color, and a very muted course, color yeah. of the past. <laughs> so yeah, it's very. Um, it's very interesting how you see that. And when you compare photos with paintings as well, um, um, you can see so much of detail in the paintings, but in the photograph, it's like you're capturing a moment in time in a still. Um, yeah, very, very so. I, I wanted to ask you, Hugh. Yeah. How did you get interested in uh, photography of the Himalayas in particular? And I really want you to come back and show more of the Himalayas. Like I feel uh, we are addicted now. Uh, after right. going through your presentation, so if you could uh, shed light on that, that how you how how did you start on this journey, and what an incredible right. journey it is. Uh, right. Well, I don't know if we've got time to cover it all now. Uh, basically, I I trained as a 
professional photographer back in the early 70s. Um, and I'm in 75, I made a trip overland to India through Afghanistan and Pakistan, India, and then up to Nepal. And that was my first introduction to the Himalaya. Um, and I spent about three months traveling around and it was one of those sort of life changing experiences. And I became addicted to India in the Himalaya. And since 1975, I've been coming back regularly ever since traveling around, um, taking photographs for myself. And then increasingly, I started to discover there was this huge body of work by earlier photographers. So I started collecting their work. Uh, and in parallel with that, I turned inadvertently from a photographer to an antiquarian bookseller and started specializing in books on India and Himalayas and then importing books from India to England um, and then evolved into a symbiotic mix of photographer, bookseller, researcher, collector of early photography. Um, so I. I I find it hard to define exactly <laughs> what I do professionally anymore. It's 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 a, it's a mix of about four different trades. But uh, I, as I said, I've been coming back to India regularly up until COVID hit uh, every six months or a year ever since, um, exploring and traveling around and uh, and collecting material and researching. So. That's it, really. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by far, my favorite is that one with the movement, you know, capturing a movement where those uh, kids are uh, falling into uh, the jhelum. Uh, oh, jhelum yes. Or is it the Dal Lake? I don't, I don't know. But it's, it's, it's just yes. a beautiful photograph capture, capturing movement. It's, uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's a picture that could only have been taken, you know, in the 1900s when photography had evolved to the point where you could actually take instantaneous photographs. Uh, in the 1860s, you couldn't have even begun to photograph anything like that because you needed a, you know, five or 10 or 15 second exposure. So any movement just turned into a blur. Um, whereas by the 1890s, you had advances in technology where you had fast sensitive film that and fast shutters on camera so you could actually capture swift movement and the whole concept of the snapshot became possible and this is a classic example that could yeah. could not have been taken probably 10 years earlier than that and quite a task you know because nowadays we have you know our phones and those uh, just clicking away clicking away without a thought uh, yes. and then posting it posting it and that the tangibility of holding a photograph, of making sure that your reel got processed properly, you know, all that excitement of the unknown and then uh, uh, having it in your hands and saying, oh, my God, what a wonderful photograph. Oh, my eyes blinked, you know, that kind of a yes. thing. Yeah. And um, with this particular photograph, I remember a moment um, uh, just uh, about two uh, two years ago, I was in uh, the Banjar Valley and I was trying my best to take a slow motion video of myself. Um, mm. um, jumping into a gurgling stream, which was a little deep in some area. And uh, I, I hurt, I nearly missed my knee and I, I, I would have been in a very bad state. You know, that whole idea, the joy of being in movement and capturing that movement. I, it's just, uh, I just love this photograph. And, uh, you know, thank you for sharing, Hugh. And uh, I, I will open uh, the uh, forum for questions. Uh, we also have uh, people from Kashmir here. So we have Tar Tara is here and uh, Tara was commenting on a few of the photographs uh, you showed. Uh, oh, Tara, yeah. if you're here, it would be lovely to have your take on, you know, the uh, photography and uh, uh, your experience being a, a local from Srinagar. Right. Uh, I suppose I ought to uh, like quit screen share for the moment. Yeah, then... yeah. Uh, and these see. are your books uh, for uh, photographs. Oh, yes. This is the the advertising part of the, the proceedings. I, I published a range of books on photography in India, and these are just three of the books. Uh, so I'm going which... to, uh, sorry, I, if you don't mind, can I take a photograph and I can post it on the WhatsApp group for anyone who wants to buy them? 
Yes, by all means. Okay. Yes. I'll just do that. Okay. And if you have a link, uh, it would be lovely. We can share okay, that yes. as well. Yeah. No, I, I, I can, can post a link in a minute. Let me just uh, switch off this sharing and then uh, let's see. That's better. Yeah. And uh, Tara, okay, you're right. Tara is right there. Tara, it would be great if we could hear you too. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed it. I have seen some of these photographs reproduced by, you know, Kashmir enthusiasts on their yeah. Facebook pages or whatever. So I knew some of the names, but uh, yeah, I, I always find also the labels very interesting. Of course, the names of place, the spelling is different of the places. But like one was called Takte Suleiman, which actually has a very, it's actually a very sacred temple to the Kashmiri Hindus, which is yes. the community I come from. And it's called Shankracharya Temple. But the structure is very old, whatever it was <laughs> in yes. the old days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the problem we always have with these early photographers is they barely knew what they were photographing and uh, there always seemed to be 10 ways of describing what they were photographing and they didn't transcribe the local names for people places buildings at all well so it's sort of uh, you get a random assortment of names for the same structure over the years and it evolves slowly and it's but there are I mean, the funny thing is with some of the Kashmir structures or Srinagar ones particularly there are alternate names <laughs> so we have Kohimara which also has another name and there are these two iconic hills on two sides of Srinagar town overlooking Srinagar town and this is one of the two the one that has the Shankracharya temple which is also called Takte Suleiman by the Muslims yeah. so you do have two alternating stories and depends on who they are Yes. Well, so that's I've, the story of Kashmir, isn't it? Where the Hindus call things one thing and the Muslims call it something else altogether. So uh, it gets very confusing. But, <laughs> both communities are aware of the two names. And in yes. fact, you have a picture which said Islamabad. And I think most probably it's the same as today. It's called Anant Nag. It was called Anant Nag. Nag oh, yes, just. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I tended I tended to go with the title the original photographer used um, rather than renaming things. Uh, yeah, do that. Uh, you have to do it, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but very interesting, really. And the Mar Canal is, you know, it's gone now. It's been paved over. Yes. And a lot of criticism of what the government has done because what the authorities have done over time, because we had some huge floods in. 2014 in Srinagar city. And they say it's partly because, you know, the water had nowhere to go because yes. the Nala Mar, as it was called, the Nala had all been kind of paved over and things. So yeah, wonderful to see the old stuff, really. Yes. <laughs> I really right. can't all that you've done. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. I, I also noticed that when you were showing some photographs of the uh, costumes, that uh, you know, when in in uh, Himachal we see the, uh, the the cap and how the older photographs show a flattened top, and in one of the photographs where there's a hunting scene uh, for the shikar, uh, yeah. uh, you you actually see the transition of the Afghan caps in the same photograph. You see Afghan caps a little flattened, and then the totally flattened tops, which make way for the Himalayan caps later on. So that transition can be seen in one photograph, which was really uh, um, interesting. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's that I said a lot of the photographs down there, uh, which were titled as being Ladakhis, I, I think are actually people from porters down from Baltistan who are, had a slightly different headgear from Ladakhis. Mm -hmm. um, I have other photographs of the same period, mid 1860s. Of people, of people from Kulu, Lahore, actually wearing pretty close to the, to the current Himachali uh, hat. So it was obviously in some form of use even back in the 1860s. Uh, the earliest picture I have of someone wearing one is about 1865. Um, 
but they're also being worn in parallel together with uh, the caps from Baltistan and from uh, and from La from Ladakh. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, the Kashmiri the Hindus would have worn turbans. They of course, yeah. yeah, they yeah. They never. The men would never have worn a hat. No. So, I think when I'm looking at them, I mean, being well, Kashmiri. Uh, you know, distinguish, but obviously it would be difficult for a foreigner. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I mean, the, the British at that time weren't noted for their uh, subtle interpretation of native customs and costumery. So, uh, you know, they just uh, titles as to what their local guide told them it was, regardless of whether that was true or not. Yeah, but that's even today true of the so-called Indian tourists who go there. They just go for a while. They go to the famous places. They go by what the tour guide tells them. That's it. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. you've described tourists all around the world there. It's uh, yeah. the same attitude in all countries and for all tourists. So we have a question, uh, uh, Simanji Datta, and I, I can, uh, uh, you know, all of you, you can put your videos on at this point. Uh, now is the time where we have this uh, chat, um, informal. So please put your videos on, introduce yourself so we can know you as well. So Samanti Datta, over to you, if you could introduce yourself and uh, 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 Hugh will take your question. Oh, hello. Uh, I specialize in colonial imaging in the Karakoram Himalayas. So I have a special interest in Kashmir and the period that you covered. And my question to you is that, uh, would he agree or perhaps not agree that we didn't see it, but Randolph Holmes's view of the Zojila Pass, is it perhaps more dramatic and darker and more compelling than Samuel Bond's view? Um. It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think which was. Uh, let me just. Double it's check. in your little book. Oh, in the, the one in the book, yes. It's uh, in your little hmm, on homes. Right. Yes. Okay. I, 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 with my stage of dementia, I have to remember what actually uh, what image we're talking about. And uh, I ha I have a copy of the of the of his photograph in an album. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, without actually double checking and looking at I his see. image again, I'm not sure I'd want to venture a definite opinion on that. I'll have to. Uh, my see life is full of so I many images. It. I can remember which ones which. So. Uh, Yes, I'll, I'll... I just thought you might remember it because it's in your uh, little book on Holmes Camera Shikar, I think. It's yes, a very small Madam, little print. Madam, I I and remember. I have a very big original of his, which is really, what should I say, very, very striking. Right. And yes. when I went to the Zojila, I went to the Zojila Pass, I uh, actually did a comparison between the pass and Holmes's uh, reproduction of the pass. Right. And um, I'm just frantically left me more um, frantically scri scribbling through the book to try and find the image so I can venture an opinion. Um, where is it? That reminds me of uh, going to uh, Lahore to see that beautiful waterfall and uh, uh, encountering liquor bottles all around, just spoiling the view. <laughs> so, well, yes, yes. Such a tragedy today. Yeah, let me just. Uh, uh, I can't even find things in my own book now. Let's. Uh, where is it? Oh, my. Ah, right. Okay. So je la pass. Mm -hmm. This is the one you Go mean? Ahead. Yes. Yes. That. That's yes. right. That's, that's the, the one. one. Okay. Right. I'm with you now. Um, yes. It, I. I mean, his. That's a, a more spectacular image than uh, than Bourne's. It did. Bourne did of course something quite similar, but this is. Uh, yeah. This is a more spectacular. It's got more people in it, uh, and it's slightly better composed. But then, I mean, it was taken forty years later, so. Uh, you know. Well, I suppose I'm talking of composition now, maybe the angle, yeah. because one thing 
I did when I was in the Zojila Pass, I compared both photographs, bones and uh, homes. And right. I have to say what I really saw was not exactly what was in the picture. So maybe it's sort of, you know, sort of uh, changes our normal views of photography that it's just about what's in front yeah. of you. I think they use their imagination and uh, reproduce the scene yes. in, well, in a kind of way that they imaginatively saw, if I, what I'm saying is that perhaps they imaginatively saw the scene. I yeah. don't know, I just think so, because it doesn't really correlate with the past itself. Yeah. I looked very hard at the past and in the context of those pictures I've seen. And uh, I think perhaps it was maybe in their mind. I'm not saying it wasn't there, it was there. Perhaps filtered through their own imagination, the picture that we see in the end. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that between 1860 and 1900s, then the road itself had been re enlarged, expanded, rerouted, redeveloped uh, for more traffic. Mm, um, in the 1860s, it would have been a very, you know, little more than a donkey track, really, mm. and then got bashed out into a much more bigger cart road and then ultimately later on into a motorable road so the actual geography of, of the road through the past I think has varied radically over the last hundred years and the road that you got now is uh, probably substantially different from the road that was there in the 1860s although um, it's, it, it's quite a perilous road I'm sorry it's say quite again a perilous road still it's quite it's a strip and it's quite perilous and yeah. I just wonder if Holmes, for instance, this emphasis on the rocks could have been the fact that the photographers were influenced by paintings, you know, paintings of the sublime in the 19th century here. And to some of it, uh, they were perhaps consciously or unconsciously trying to effect, uh, create that sort of aesthetic effect so that you have a sort of Karakoram or Himalayan sublime, you, if you like, in many of these pictures which are quite like the sort of English and European sublime that dominated the scene, the painting, the painterly scenes in uh, Victorian Britain, for instance. I'm just suggesting that it could be since they were European photographers that they carried this sort of cultural baggage in their minds and they reproduced mountains, the type of scenery that would appeal, for instance, to a Victorian or an Edwardian audience. And it's just a thought, I think, that perhaps they were influenced by the painters. Well, I'm sure. Yes, I mean, I, I think a lot of the photographers were were very consciously in the mid nineteenth century trying to uh, transmute the picturesque concepts of painting into landscape photography. I mean, Bourne yes. said how he struggled mm -hmm. with you know trying to actually mm -hmm. produce aesthetic views of the mountains, both in Kashmir and in uh, in the Sutlej Valley. Um, purely because of the grand scale he couldn't actually fit them into a camera um that's I've right noticed, mm. i've noticed that uh you know similar rules apply now actually fi and physically finding a place to put a camera nowadays you can just stand on a a footpath somewhere and pull out a, a pocket camera when you actually have to put mm. a 10 by 12 inch plate camera up with a tripod and a darkroom tent next to it it constrains where you can physically put a a camera to take a picture um and it's uh I've, I've stood in one or two of the places in uh spitty that uh born took photographs and you can see exactly where he put the camera because that's the only place you could put a large camera with a tripod and the yeah. view you took was entirely constrained by where you could actually put a huge plate camera in order to photograph it um and that yeah. combined with trying to follow some uh visual aesthetics of uh victorian pictorialism um it's a sort of combination of the two that produces the image sometimes yeah. it works wonderfully well some of the images you know you think well why it's very impressive but why did they bother it's not a stunning image except as a technical record yes well yes that's what i, I was thinking about that to maybe the audience and yeah. obviously the photographers must have wanted to sell their images anyhow. So well, yes, they would have to cater right. to what the people wanted, what the audience would expect and want of the yes. Himalayas. Yes. You know, I think Kelvin, uh, you know, Kelvin is an artist and illustrator, an archaeological illustrator. Kelvin, uh, would you have any take on this about uh, 
you know, re uh, recreating a photograph and like, like a painting or something. And then I'll take Zoshim. If I'm mispronouncing, please forgive me. Uh, Zoshim Bodse's question. So Kelvin, after you. Well, very quickly, um, um, you of course right. Uh, 19th century photographers were steeped in their own traditions uh, of art. So if you look at early uh, portrait photography, they actually look like 17th, 18th century and uh, early 19th century paintings. They have the same thing with the chair, with the cover. Um, they have a fake landscape in the background. Um, that is the continuation in art. So I assume that when you take your camera out, uh, um, you're photographing what you think will look beautiful, but I really liked his comment about that he actually found, I assume, the flat rock where uh, Bourne had his camera standing, which is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, of course, I would like to announce Kelvin uh, and I will be teaching a course on um, art perspectives, a painting uh, of the past. So, um, the newsletter has the title and we'll be posting the date for that soon. So anybody wants to enroll, it's online. You can do that. Um, over to uh, Zoshim Bodse's question. I, you, thanks for this wonderful I, okay, talk. Yeah. I, I, I think it was a bit too short. Um, well, I can go on for another three hours if you like. <laughs> yes, I would have liked it. Um, but something about the Bourne and Shepherd, I wanted to ask you. Um, the early carte visite that we have, I mean, those with the date 1864, et cetera, with, with some of Bourne's views, they actually mentioned three names, Howard, Bourne, and Shepherd. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How about Mr. Howard? Well, we don't know a huge amount. I mean, when Bourne came to India in 63, he initially established a studio with William Howard, who was a Calcutta photographer. They moved to Simla together and set up Howard and Bourne from 1863, four into five. Um, they were later joined by Charles Shepherd. Um, and the studio was briefly Howard, Bourne and Shepherd. And then Howard, in 1865, uh, Howard died, we think of uh, typhoid. And the studio then, from 1865, 66 onwards, became Born and Shepherd, which it stayed for the next 100 years and more. Um, but I still know comparatively little about the life of William Howard. It's not very well documented at all, beyond the fact that he previously had a Calcutta studio and then moved to Simla. Um, may I just um, have another short question? Um, John Murray and his wife were photographed by uh, in Bourne Studio in Simla. Uh, are there no photographs by Dr. John Murray about the area? Um, I, I had the impression that he took photographs over there. Uh, I haven't found any uh, views of Kashmir by Murray at all, no. Um, so, yes, I mean, I'm sure I, I keep saying that uh, uh, God, I can't remember people's names now. Um, what's his name was uh, the first uh, Melville Clark was the first photographer um, in 1861. There may have been someone else with a camera. Um, I mean, but Murray was active in the 1850s. I found no references to him working in Kashmir, um, but that doesn't mean to say he didn't. Um, but I, I would have been lovely if he had, but uh, given the problems of taking a camera, his the size he worked with to Kashmir, I'm not surprised he didn't. If that okay, helps. thank you. Maybe <laughs> there are more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Right. Um, there's some queries here in the chat. There's somebody's asked if 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 Bourne produced a catalogue. Uh, so I just say there was the studio did produce a variety of catalogues. So all of his uh, Bourne's work in India is available. There, there are reprints of the catalogue of the 
Born and Shepherd published all of their prints they had for sale. So yes, there are, there is a catalog available. Okay. Anything else? Francis, I mean, there's such a lot of uh, chat here. I'm trying to work out if there's any other questions I could answer, but uh, that seems to be the main one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry. Have, any more questions? Yeah, we have Navjot Kaur. Um, she is um, working in the Jammu region on archaeology. So Navjot, over to Hi. you. Thank you so much you, for such a fascinating presentation. It My was pleasure. it was mesmerizing to see photographs of old, old Kashmir. I have two questions, queries actually to ask you. Um, one is if you have come across you show in one of your photographs the inflated cattle skin across river. Mazoks, yeah. Oh, Mazoks, yeah. yes, yes. Um, so there is this thing in in Jammu, which I was, which I had recorded while doing my PhD, was that they used um, across river Chenab, they used inflated goat skins to actually sort of catch hold of the timber coming up from Kishtawar and Rajori areas. So they would actually cut the rivers from the upper reaches of Kishtwar and the uh, through the down action of river Chenab, the logs will sort of come down to the plains of Jammu and people would actually jump jump into the rivers using these inflated goat skins. Right. Uh, I had just read about it in Frederick Drew's The Jammu and Kashmir Territory, but I do not really have an actual account, like visual account. Do you by any chance in in any of your photographs have this 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 uh, documentation of this um, practice in Jammu. Right. I don't think I've, 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 for obscure reasons, I've been collecting pictures of mussocks and their uses as mm -hmm. uh, for boating in the Himalaya for ages. I, one of my projected book projects is going to be something like Musuk Men of the Himalaya, because okay. I've got a lot of pictures of people crossing rivers and paddling around on the lake in Nainital on, in inflated mussocks. Most of the ones I've seen appear to be ox hides of some sort, ox skins uh, yeah. or buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I've seen anything that was specifically a goat skin because they've mm -hmm. been quite small. I know goat skin mussocks were used for carrying water in. And, mm -hmm. um, but I would have thought they were too small. I mean, if if you use small ones as floats to attach to timber, right. um, I'm not sure I'd want to actually use one to cross a river myself. I just they look. I would have thought a goat one would be too small, but I could be wrong on that. And if, if it's I okay, correctly it's... remember it, I think Frederick Drew does talk about. Um, I I will have to counter check it, but I think he does talk about goat. Uh, skin being inflated and you know sort of worked out as a as a as a as a help to the person who sort of jumps in for him to sort of inflate over the water yeah but i will have to i think it is good i'm 80 yeah. percent sure he talks it about it could well be i don't know the, the the photographs i have and i have been obsessively collecting pictures of mm -hmm. people crossing rivers in mussocks for years now all the ones they have are very large and i'm sure they're from uh oxen or cows yeah. or or buffalo i don't right. think i've seen anything that looks small enough to just be a goat skin unless they're very large goats of course okay um, i'd like to add but that doesn't mean to here. say there are it may be that uh they were using them and nobody thought them worthy of photography i mean you know the early photography in this region only catches a tiny percentage of the life that was going mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. particular photographers thought was of merit or would produce a saleable photograph. Mm. So that's primary mm. constraint of a lot of mm -hmm. photographers in the region is can I sell prints of this? Mm. If they mm. couldn't, couldn't, then they didn't take the picture. Right, right. And Jodh, you could look into the Kulu area as well because uh, there uh -huh. are a lot of photographs in the Kulu region of people crossing uh, the river right. uh, on right. uh, uh, Mazox. And also with the timber thing that you were talking about, yeah. especially in Kulu, you know, the Sood community was heavily into right. timber, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, they used to be, uh, you know, um, um, sawed off in the upper reaches and would be afloat in the river and mm -hmm. would be caught mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. areas like um, uh, Bajora and all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I guess you could look into the archives and see maybe right. you find uh, any right. evidence of goats. Right. Goat. 
goats being used goat skin yeah maybe yeah, they yeah. have some uh, i don't know but there's one place that you could look into and mm-hmm. i think kelvin yeah and then uh, kelvin uh, just wrote on his chat that mm-hmm. an azirian relief talks about mm-hmm. uh, has uh, an illustration of a goat. Uh, of a goat mm-hmm. so a small goat yeah so yeah, yeah these are two places that you could look yeah, into yeah Yeah. I'll, I'll go into Kullu yeah. thing, I think. I'll, I'll start looking into Kullu. Yeah. And there's yeah. one more thing that I want to ask um, you. Um, yes. Is that there is this, uh, uh, in 2016, I think we were documenting a tradition in Kashmir, which was using of gold coins as um, sort of giving into marriages. The Muslims, they do it. They give gold, sovereign gold, which is Edward or uh, I think it's Edward, um, Tsar, Nicholas Tsar, and then um, Victoria, Queen Victoria, and George. So they give these uh, sovereign gold as um, sort of, um, you know, as a, uh, for, for bride and the groom as a, um, as a security for right. future. Um, this probably started in the 19th century, this tradition. Um, um, the tradition of coming up of gold coins in Kashmir probably started in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then we do not really have evidence of these women, married women, wearing these coins, which they do it now. They wear it as a necklace. They do wear these gold sovereign as a necklace. Right. Do you have anything of that sort in your photo repository? Like women, married women wearing yeah. gold sovereign as necklace or something like that? I, I'd have to look. I mean, I'd, I have an, artic, uh, an archive sort of of real photographs and digital imagery of God knows how many thousand images. So actually, off the top of my head, I have to go and search through the files to find things. Off the top of my head, I can't remember having anything specific, but okay. that means nothing. I'd have to look and come back to you on that. Um, I may well have, I mean, the, specifically with relation to Kashmir, I have mm-hmm. comparatively few portrait studies of the people. Mm-hmm. um it most of the photographers there were doing landscape and architecture right. and mountainscapes comparatively right. few of the people and there's as, as you i showed half the time when they photographed kashmiris they turned out to be baltis or ladakhis yeah. anyway mm-hmm. um and again very few pictures of women in kashmir for all mm-hmm. the cultural reasons about mm-hmm you know women getting their picture taken in that right. at that time so you have notch girls and not really anyone else um right so i'd have to look and see if i've got anything else relevant that i can't think of if if i'd had any other stunning portraiture mm-hmm. of kashmiri men or women from that period mm-hmm. i would have included mm-hmm. it but mm-hmm. there's a severe dearth of it it's all landscape okay uh, and also, uh, Navjot, if you look at photographs mm-hmm. of the Swat Valley, uh, uh-huh. even right into the 1980s, um, they were still using um, mazoks. I was still in that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the Swat Valley, all right. Yeah, yeah. So look into Swat Valley as well. Yeah. I remember... Yeah, I I, I, I remember uh, going through this book, uh, uh, co- colored photographs, and I saw one mm-hmm. of them where they were crossing the river. So it was like, you know, I'm sure Hugh knows that it was a tradition across, right, through the Karakorams and mm-hmm. the Himalayas. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. I will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sonali. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you so much for answering the questions. Yeah. Pleasure. And Aryan mentions that they have a similar tradition of, uh, you know, what you just suggested about future brides in his area. Aryan, maybe you can um, elaborate a little bit on that. Maybe Navjot can get some kind of um, um, more ideas about what's going on. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hi, hi. So, ma'am, I Hindi. Okay, ha, ha, main, I'll translate for everyone. Aryan, uh, go ahead, talk in Hindi. Yeah. Uh, Actually, मैं आपको ये जो बात कर रहे थे mainly कि future brides को कुछ gold gift जाता है कि शादी के बाद मतलब हम इसका tradition mainly मैं आपको समझाऊँ तो हमारे यहाँ इसको बांधा डालना कहते हैं local language में so ये मेरे हाथ में जो ये इसको धागलू धागलू कहते हैं 
तो आ, मेरी दादी कहते हैं कि जब उनका शादी हुआ था मैरिज मतलब जब उन्हें देखने सबसे पहले गए थे तो उनके हाथ में ये एज अ बांधा मतलब दोनों हाथों में ये लगा था कि अब जो आपकी बेटी है वो अब हमारी बेटी बन चुके हैं इट्स लाइक कि एक कमिटमेंट और इसको वापस करना बहुत ज्यादा बुरी चीज माना जाता है कि बांधा वापस कर दिया मतलब अंगेजमेंट भी आप कह सकते हैं सम काइंड ऑफ एक पहाड़ी ट्रेडिशन का क्योंकि आफ्टर दैट आफ्टर वन ईयर और मतलब कपल ऑफ इयर्स आपको मैरिज फिर करना ही पड़ता है ये बांधा इज समथिंग लाइक जो सिक्योरिटी उन्होंने कहा ये उस तरह का ही था Okay. तो uh, मैंने भी अपने रीजन में पुराने टाइम अब तो मेनली जो पंजाबी मैरिज है उसको हम बहुत ज्यादा फॉलो करते हैं बट जो एक टिपिकल पहाड़ी मैरिज सिस्टम था तो उसमें ये बांधा डालने का प्रोसेस काफी इम्पोर्टेंट था और जिसमें ये एज कई बार नोज पिन भी दी जाती थी कई बार जो चंद्र सेन होते हैं उन्हें भी दिया जाता था और मेनली ज्यादातर छोटा जो एक्सेसिबल uh, मतलब छोटी एक्सेसरीज वही गिफ्ट की जाती थी लाइक वही ज्यादा बड़ी चीजें नहीं it was almost like honor so what uh, aryan is saying in his region uh, b- before the marriage when uh, it was like a security for accepting uh, the bride and uh, they would give something uh, something of value it may be a trinket it may be something um, uh, it was it was more of an action of uh, the daughter is ours and now if you give it back it's considered really bad so Uh, so functionality of uh, something valuable even if though it's small it's almost to the level of pride mm-hmm. that uh, you you cannot um, um negate the importance of what is given and ex- that's acceptance but w- what is peculiar of these sovereigns in kashmir dr sonali is this um they have the insignia of um zar nicholas um and queen is is elizabeth George or Edward, and on the obverse you will have a dragon, uh, a king slaying a dragon. So okay. those insignia, those gold sovereigns with these specific insignia are still used in Kashmir, and they are they are the ones that are used. You do not really use any other, you know, gold coin. They are very specific gold sovereigns still being used um, in exchange uh, when you sort of exchange uh, things in the marriage. The bride will get. gold sovereign maybe two or three and the groom will get depending on who exactly is your relation they will get these so i'm gold. thinking and at the level of conjecturing uh, was the uh, uh, the uh, the royal family were they um, uh, using these sovereigns as well because a lot of times what happens is we emulate what the higher ups are doing Uh, it may mm-hmm. come to you know uh, vessels they use they'll replicate it you know mm-hmm. or you know traditions like that that makes them be a part of the tradition the larger tradition of what the higher ups are following do you think right. it could be that um we we sort of did an interview in the area and we what we what we got information we got was it was not it was it is now very recently like i don't know maybe a 100 years old tradition or maybe 70 80 years old tradition um uh, very pronounced in muslim community it is not in done muslim by communities Sikhs. yeah it's not done by sikhs i am a sikh from kashmir we don't do it at all it's not done by hindus they don't really do that but then we did come across a couple of um, hindu families which who, who were of the opinion that oh we used to do it in the past now we don't do it now it's just very very peculiar to to the muslim community so maybe maybe uh, you know um on the pakistan side of kashmir maybe uh-huh. if, uh, i think you should investigate on that side also if uh-huh. they have remnants of this tradition there yeah. even now because yeah. i think that will be very helpful um mm-hmm. just tap on to their memories and see and what is the link yeah. between you know um, you said the king of uh, uh, george and edward george and Britain. edward and and yeah. russia too you said right yeah nicholas czar very few coins very few sovereign and then uh, queen elizabeth very few of them very but then i them. think edward is preferred a lot by locals so why edward. he is preferred yeah. maybe he did yeah. something that yeah. was good yeah, for the yeah. community and maybe that what he, good he did has been forgotten but it lives yeah. on in the coins themselves so yeah. so many times we forget traditions but we uh, stay with the tangible uh, aspect of it forgetting yeah. what it yeah. actually meant so yeah. yeah it's it's really interesting i never knew of this but yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> try kashmir on the other side you know 
I know uh, <laughs> we have like a border, but uh, digitally we don't. So yeah, yeah, yeah. reach out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's so much to learn, you know, from photographs on things, you know, we talked about the mazoks, we talked about coins and uh, the notch girls and all of that. So this is what it does. Uh, photographs give you triggers for memory, for things that you can question. And Hugh, this has been such a fascinating talk. And I'm really looking forward to the other ones for all the Himalayas that you've captured and you bring to us in this little Zoom box from wherever we are. Um, and as is tra tradition with the Hicks talks, please leave us with words of wisdom. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I have much wisdom left to offer. Um, well, just to say thank you very much for everyone who uh, who's turned out for this. There's, uh, I see some old friends have tuned in and people I don't know. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time. I hope you've enjoyed it, learned something. Um, if you have any other queries about aspects of photography in the Himalaya, then I'm always open to uh, help where I can. So you can always uh, drop me an email and I'll, I'll respond and offer help and advice where I can. Um, wearing my other hat uh, as a publisher, I'm happy to sell books on uh, aspects of uh, Himalayan and Indian photography. And if you're feeling very wealthy, I even buy and sell vintage photographs. So uh, I can always uh, sell you some original images if you're feeling un unduly wealthy and want to cure it. Um, yeah, other than that, thank you very much. And I hope you all enjoyed it. We uh, most certainly did. And uh, we're looking forward to your next talk uh, soon. And uh, for all of you who are present here, please follow the Himalayan Institute, www.worldwideweb.hicks.org, H-I-C-H-S.org. Subscribe to our newsletter. I had written it up on the chat earlier. You can, it's a free newsletter. And um, just scroll down, put in your uh, email ID and check mark, and uh, you, uh, you'll be subscribed. If you want access to the previous newsletters, please uh, uh, send a note to me on WhatsApp. I uh, wrote it on the chat as well. My number plus one eight one eight three five nine seven two three seven. And uh, next weekend we have a talk, um, uh, and it's a musical session by uh, two youngsters from the Shimla region, uh, who will be um, uh, tuning us to uh, old tunes, uh, Him Himalayan tunes, in from the Shimla region. With the, in a modern context. So please uh, uh, come for our talks and support what we do here uh, on our Saturday Vibe sessions at 7.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Follow us on social media. Share your photographs of Jammu and Kashmir this month. Um, we just tag us, uh, follow us, uh, tag us and share your photos and we'll show your perspectives to the world. And uh, thank you again for being present. And um, this was such a lovely Saturday morning for me. And I hope it's a good Saturday night for all of you. Take care and be inspired for from people like Hugh. Thank you, Hugh, for being My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, and one, what one, you do. One, no, one last query. Um, several people who wanted to tune in today couldn't be there and they all wanted to know if it was going to be recorded, which obviously it is, and how they could access a recording of it. Uh, is there a possibility to share that at some point? Yes, I will. I've been rather uh, procrastinating in uh, uploading the videos, uh, but I'll definitely try to do it this month and I'll share you the link as soon as I'm done. Yeah, that would be great because yeah. as a lot of people um, one one of my friends said, oh, well, I'd love to do it, but I'm in Bali at the moment, so I can't uh, be there. So I'm not quite sure what a barrier that was. No, but no, anyway. we will, we, we will, we will uh, take the video to him wherever he is uh, soon. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take That's care and uh, please do send the link so we can share it on um, uh, our WhatsApp group. And if anybody wants to join our group, please feel free to give the number. And uh, all of you here, looking forward to seeing you all next weekend for more from the Himalayan Institute. Bye and have a lovely night. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you all, all very much. Yeah. And I've and just put to, the, the yeah. website. 
Yeah, pagodatreepress.com, everyone, yeah. for those who want to get up yeah. close and personal with Hugh Grainer's work. Yeah, and yeah. you can email me through the website, of course. Great. And Kelvin, thanks so much for introducing me to. Yeah, cheers, Kelvin. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> okay yeah goodbye. and you before yeah, you go goodbye. sorry i had one uh, other thing i was thinking yes. maybe you should do an exhibition at the institute uh in india well at the institute like at our institute uh well it's a possibility yes um i could put something together the problem the technical problem is one literally of if i take expensive vintage photographs to india theoretically it's almost impossible to take them out again as antique oh. the, the problems about I, I can put together an exhibition which is done of of reproductions yes surely I, I can't i can't do an exhibition of original images no no it doesn't matter you know the whole idea is to disseminate this knowledge yes yeah I mean, the... certainly you could do something with, with uh with reprints from from original images yeah, yeah but i mean that, i'm i'm interested in doing that absolutely I, having exactly. i've got a huge collection of material and i for me it's important to share it with people you know who live in the neighborhood you know there are people who've never seen early photographs of the village they live in you know and i've got stuff here in england that they've never seen so i'm always very keen to share it where i can yeah that would be lovely i think let's uh Let's have a session. Let's uh, talk. Um, you know, whenever you're free next, uh, I'll I'll message you. But I yes. really want you to come and do this exhibition of uh, you know. Uh, I think it yeah. would be such a huge success. Like I I really want everybody to know your work. I'm sure yeah. they already do, but there's so many others, you know, uh, who who are not acquainted and they and and they need to see it. The locals especially. It's so important for them to know about their roots, about what was. And uh, yeah, yeah. So so let's do it, Hugh. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And thank you all for being here. Those who come here for the first time, um, I'm so um, uh, thankful that you could take your time and be here. And uh, would love to see more of you. And if you have, um, uh, you know, all of you are stalwarts. Most of you are stalwarts in your field in Himalayan studies be it the trans Himalayas, the Karakuram or the Himalayas, I see them all as an extension. So please do give a talk and um, let us all be enlightened with what your journey, uh, you know, with the mountains. Yeah. Great. great. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.